Welcome to another episode of Scott Reads Comics. Today we'll be covering Classic X-Men number 18. If you recall, uh, way back in episode 3, I covered Classic X-Men 17, where Magneto ultimately at the end captured or confronted the X-Men after they had been uh, under the control of Mesmero and forced to act as uh, carnival performers. So here we are with the follow-up, which includes the um, epic battle between uh, Magneto and uh, the X-Men. And uh, this classic X-Men 18, published in 1987, uh, sports a beautiful cover and front piece by Arthur Adams and Terry Austin. We see Magneto uh, with the X-Men literally in the, in the palms of his hands. And we open to our front piece, we get an excellent... A uh, shot of the Beast and Nightcrawler in acrobatic action together here. Pretty cool. Also on the front piece, we have our, um, our, our creators for this issue. Chris Claremont writes everything. Actually, correction. Chris Claremont writes the main story. Uh, Joe Duffy writes the backup story. And we'll get to that one. Uh, Tarmor Zachowski on the letters, all, all 32 pages. Petra Scottis on the colors, all 32 pages. Uh, John Byrne, um, great artist, uh, pencils, pages 1, 4 through 16, and 18 to 20. Karen Dwyer uh, pencils the new material to kind of fill in the story, pages 2 to 3 and 17. John Bolton does our backup story, pages 21 to 32. Terry Austin inks pages 1 to 20. John Bolton inks himself on pages 21 to 32. Um, John Bolton is also responsible for our wonderful back cover. Uh, Jean Grey in the wilderness in repose, a figure lurking in the background there in shadow. Jim Shooter was the original editor, and Ascenti is the current editor, and the editor-in-chief is Tom DeFalco, with the assistant being Terry Cavanaugh. So our title is Magneto Triumphant, and we see a great John Byrne, Terry Austin splash page here. Um, again, this is uh, them re cl reaching close to the zenith of their uh, powers here, um, pre-Dark Phoenix saga on X-Men. They're really, really humming at this point. Um, this was originally um, presented in um, Uncanny X-Men 116, I believe, or 115. I'll check that. Um, but here, Magneto, after, after KOing Mesmero in our previous issue, uh, says to the X-Men, I'm a man of my word. Mutants, I swore I would destroy you, and so I shall. So in here, we have a new piece, two pages of new material by Karen Dwyer and Terry Austin, where each of the X-Men have um, some um, thought balloon um, exposition on uh, this confrontation with Magneto. I won't dwell on all of them. I'll just pick a couple here. Uh, Phoenix thinks, I can hear you, Scott, but there's intense psychic interference blocking me from the other's thoughts and Magneto's as well. Sorry, lover. I'll need time to gather sufficient strength to break through. So Cyclops has asked her to establish a psi link among the eight of us and if possible, pick Magneto's brains as well so we can get an idea of his plans. Beast thinks, oh, my stars and garters, for this one I skipped out on the Avengers. X-Men probably figure they can handle this by themselves, but Magneto's too formidable a foe to take that kind of risk. First chance I get, I'll make a beeline for my hidden Quinjet and call in reinforcements. Little does the Beast know that that is not a possibility. And finally, Wolverine thinks, for all his powers, Maggie's still only a man. If he's cut, he'll bleed. Let the others keep him busy. Draw the heavy fire, and I'll finish him. Nice. Kieran Dwyer and Wolverine there. He's really got a cool command of his, like, um, blocky kind of thickness. And now we're back into the original Burn austin um, sequences here. Wolverine charges forward. Magneto, not, uh, the other's holding him back. And Magneto just observing until he answers Cyclops. You're that already, my friend. But why not give your little madman his, his moment of glory? He could use a lesson in manners. Everyone outside on the double, Cyclops orders. Nightcrawler, scout ahead. So here's where the X-Men get a rude awakening. <laughs> um, the carnival 
wagon that they were in is miles above the surface of the earth now due to Magneto's amazing powers. And uh, Nightcrawler is hanging on for dear life as he had teleported out and just managed to catch himself on the stairs of the wagon. So the X-Men are kind of in a tough spot here, not wanting to press the action too heavily because Magneto obviously controls their fate since he is um, transporting them against their will. Wolverine says, The elf is safe, big fella, but Buckethead ain't. If you want me, madman, here I am. I defy you to do your worst. Bub, that's music to my ears. Again, Wolverine is held back, this time by Cyclops. Phoenix says, Wolverine, don't. You crazy loon. For once in your misbegotten life, think before you act. We're ten miles up, man. Whose power do you think is holding a, a goddess here and keeps us alive? So he's basically pointing out the obvious. If um, Magneto is taken out, they're going to fall. Um, and maybe they might, might not even be resourceful enough to, um, uh, to figure out how to save themselves. And here we have the obligatory recap of the events of uh, Classic X-Men um, 17, where the Beast found the X-Men imprisoned by Mesmero in this carnival and controlled by him. And then at the end, Magneto revealed himself as the ultimate villain, even taking out uh, Mesmero. <clears throat> and so here we see Mesmero is still fallen. This makes no sense. Why is that Mesmero? You and he used to be allies. He and I? My dear Cyclops, I don't even know the man. The Magneto, this fool served, the one who claimed to be the father of Lorna Dane, was a robot. So shades of all the Doom bots that are running around, the robotic doubles of Dr. Doom, Magneto had a robotic double too. And during the classic um, Neil Adams sen uh, Sentinel story, it was revealed that he was a robot when the um, Sentinels captured Mesmero and uh, Magneto just kind of, um, the robotic Magneto sort of fell apart under, under their assault. So here he, um, uh, while this exposition is going on, um, some fighter jets approach because they've detected on radar this insane um, flying wagon. Barely half hour has passed since they, they left Sullivan County, yet the flying wagon has gone over 4,000 miles from West Texas to the uncharted wilds of the Andes Mountains. Its flight has not gone unnoticed. Jaguar control to Jaguar leader, do you have visual contact with the UFO over? Jaguar leader, respond. This is just General Ortiz, over. Um, and these pilots can't really describe what they're seeing. It's so strange. Meanwhile, Magneto decides to rid himself of Mesmero and uses his powers to blast him out of the, um, out of the wagon in safely inside a cocoon of energy and send him back earthward. And St Storm is aghast. You monster, even if Mesmero was your most hated enemy, to callously hurl him to his death. You underestimate me. My power, you underestimate my powers, young woman. I am controlling Mesmero's descent. His landing will be painful, but that's no more than he deserves. So Magneto um, doesn't, reveals he isn't going to kill Ma uh, Mesmero. He's just sending him away rather harshly. And so here we see an amazing sequence as the X-Men are forced to... Um, basically sit and wait and buy their time for an opportunity. And we see this wagon now, wagon now heading back earthward. Um, and then they're over land again, the bleak, desolate expanse of snow and ice that's the seventh of Earth's continents, Antarctica. The X-Men have no idea where they are or where they're going as the wagon skims mile after mile of trackless waste. So... They're headed to the base of Magneto, which is in the um, caldera of this active volcano in uh, Antarctica. Then, with a soundless splash, the wagon hits the lava and drops beneath the surface. All aboard, save, Mag save Magneto himself, are, are, are more than a little surprised to find themselves still alive as the wagon heads unerringly for a ceramic steel dome set in the floor of the secondary fissure. So Magneto's powers at this point are so awesome that he's able to defy the raging lava of a volcano and safely land this wagon in his super high-tech base. And suddenly here in this cool um, long panel, 
we see uh, Magneto bursting the wagon finally and, the, and scattering the X-Men like 10 pins. Goddess, the wagon, Storm says. Welcome to my humble home, X-Men. I hope you like it because you won't be leaving. And down here on this excellent double page um, narrow panel that runs the bottom of pages 10 and 11, we see a, a super cool cutaway of Magneto's volcano base. Uh, home it may be, but this underground complex is far from humble. Buried a mile beneath the ice cap, it covers an area of five square miles, one of a number of similar installations Magneto has scattered throughout the globe. Drawing its power directly from the Earth's core, the complex is totally self-sufficient and virtually impregnable, a masterpiece of automated technology that would do Tony Stark or Reed Richards proud. So Magneto is many things. He's an extremely powerful mutant who can control magnetic and related energies. He is an uh, erstwhile companion and friend of Charles Xavier. He has in the past shown extreme um, resistance to psychic attack and psychic powers and even demonstrated a bit of psychic power himself. And apparently he is an awesome engineer able to use his powers and his scientific knowledge to build this incredible base. And we're going to see a little more of that as we go along here. The X-Men land unceremoniously on the ground of this large gallery, which they appear in, um, and they immediately go on the attack, trying to stop Magneto. I've got to start things off myself and work everyone else in as we go along. I hate to disillusion you, Magneto, but zapping us isn't going to be that easy. Take him, Colossus. So here Cyclops zaps Magneto with his uh, optic beams. And uh, then Colossus wades in. And uh, I can't tell you just how cool these issues are to me as a huge fan of the Beast and the Beast in his transformed blue form. Seeing him drawn by Vernon Austin, seeing him with the new X-Men fighting with them. When he wasn't involved in Giant Size X-Men number one, I kind of missed him there. He had already left um, the circle of the X-Men at that point and moved on. And so here, seeing him have this cool three, four-story adventure with the new X-Men and drawn by Vernon Austin. This is so cool. And um, Colossus fails. Uh, he tries to strike Magneto, but Magneto has personal force fields, and Colossus being composed of organic steel is very susceptible to Magneto's powers. Your armored form makes you the weakest X-Man, and he hurls him away. Not bad, Mag Not bad, Maggie, the Beast says, but let's see you try that stunt with a genuine, guaranteed, non-ferrous beast. Kawabunga, sweetums. One of the beast's um, sort of uh, common catchphrases. I have something better in store for you, Avenger, namely a multi-kilovolt static charge. Here we show uh, Magneto's mastery of other energies as well. So he shocks the beast and then hurls him away almost telekinetically into the side of one of the bulkheads of his base. And uh, he's half knocked out. Uh, so now Storm, after being shocked at uh, how easily he was dispatched, steps up and tries herself to take Magneto on. So here she gets the drop on him and assaults him. Um, she does. She can't use her lightning because she knows Magneto can turn that against her. But she knows that cold um, will uh, work against him. So she assaults him with her elemental powers. A blizzard rips up out of nowhere around Magneto, the bitter cold and hundred knot winds slicing through to the very marrow of his bones. A normal man would have been battered unconscious in seconds. You almost had me, my dear, yet at the last instant you held back. That was a fatal mistake. So now Magneto takes her out, declaring himself a living superconductor. So he is a Swiss army knife of uh, superhuman power here. And Magne uh, uh, Nightcrawler watching Magneto from the shadows. He's doing it to us again, taking our best shots and then smashing us down. It's cool this effect Byrne and Austin achieve here by showing one of Nightcrawler's sometimes overlooked powers, the ability to blend in into darkness and hide um, with his uh, extremely dark furred skin. And uh, just a neat little effect there. So he leaps tries to spring down on Magneto, and he, too, is shocked unconscious. And sent careening into Colossus, who Magneto decides now to bring down from his um, suspension near the roof, and he's going to smash the two together. Colossus 
realizing the danger and, and not wanting to harm his friend transforms back into his human form and whammo, both of them are um, knocked unconscious. Stunned though he is by the impact, Peter Rasputin still manages to make the best of a bad landing, cushioning Kurt Wagner's body with his own. And here, Banshee springs into action. As Magneto says, five down, three to go. So Banshee's flying in, going to use his sonic powers. Magneto dodges one of his bolts. And he faints here with an old tactic he used against Banshee in classic X-Men 12. Uh, he was going to encode, encode him in um, some particles of ferrous metal. But Banshee sets up a counter field, but somehow Magneto um, counters that and KOs Banshee. Walls vibrating, low frequency sonics, mind, entire body, feel like I'm tearing apart. So Banshee is taken out. Colossus, or I should say Cyclops, blasts him again with his optic blast, but Magneto puts up a force field to shield himself. And he's, Cyclops continues to batter away as we get a cool... Um, uh, distant shot and then a narrower shot where we just see the two heads of the characters. It's a neat uh, little device there by Byrne and Austin. And then he hurls Cyclops away with his power and takes him out unconscious. But where is Phoenix? Well, here she comes. First off, Magneto, the name isn't Marble Girl anymore. What in the name of sanity? I'm being assaulted on myriad levels, physical and psychic by power that rivals Xavier's. It's Phoenix. Good Lord, Magneto exclaims. So this is his first um, experience with um, <clears throat> battling Phoenix. Um, so he doesn't know that Marvel Girl was transformed uh, back in X-Men 101 into Phoenix. And he hasn't faced her raw power before. And... Um, she is about to uh, overwhelm him with her cosmic might. But here we get um, a page of uh, Kieran Dwyer, Terry Austin, an additional page that Claremont has added to fill out the story. And this page kind of focuses on how Phoenix is still gauging the limits of her powers, still testing herself, and still a little bit unsure of, of what those limits are and what she should do with them. Or should she rage against them, push beyond them, uh, truly embrace the full might of her powers? Gloves are off now. No more fooling around. He's fighting back. Could I have risked a confrontation before our arrival? Fought Magneto in the wagon and kept the X-Men from falling to their deaths? I don't know. That's the problem. I don't know my capabilities. Sure, people say I saved the universe, but I did that mostly on instinct. It was Phoenix's doing. Jean Grey was just along for the ride. Magneto has strength plus his decades of experience. I'm equal to the one, not the other. In too many ways, it's as though I was just been born. So this added exposition is kind of cool. It doesn't take away from the story. It adds a little bit to the story because if you just read it here, she's confronting him. And then if you, if you ignore this additional page that was added, we go to the next Burn Austin page, but there's no more left. I've reached some sort of limit, but I thought I had no limit. So here, years and years before this was written, Claremont was already hinting at the fact that Phoenix was unsure of her powers and put limits on herself. This kind of flushes that out a little more, adding a little more to the meat, meat on the a little more meat on the bones. So Magneto is in luck. Phoenix um, flames up due to her own psychic circuit breakers. He overwhelms her. Wolverine recovers, because that's what he does. And he takes a shot at Magneto, but uncharacteristically misses with his claws. Or maybe characteristically, because really, aside from X-Men 133, he cuts very few people with his claws over the course of the whole series, simply because of the comics code. Um, but anyway, here, he just catches a piece of his cape. Magneto then realizes he can just control Wolverine because he has so much adamantium in his body. And he makes Wolverine knock himself out, chooses not to kill him. I've won. I faced my deadliest foes and beat them all. So now, in the next page and a half, we're about to see some more of that Magneto genius on display. He's a master technologist. 
He's also a master roboticist because here he has built this robot nanny um, and he explains why. I'm a proud man, X-Men. Your mentor, Charles Xavier, and my treacherous creation, Alpha, humbled me. At their hands, I was reduced to infancy. But then, deep within my soul, I remembered what I had been and hated what I had become. In my rage, I swore dark and bloody vengeance against Xavier and those he loves best in the world, you X-Men. When I was first resurrected, I determined to kill you all, but I've since found a more appropriate revenge. So, Magneto is referring to the events um, several years before this story in uh, Defenders 15 and 16. So very early on in the Defenders title, Professor Xavier guest stars. The Defenders fight Magneto and the Brotherhood of Evil, which at the time included Blob, included Blob Eunice the Untouchable, Mastermind, and... Um, Vertigo, or she was one of the Savage Land mutants. I think it was Vertigo. Uh, at the end of that battle, uh, Magneto had created um, a super mutant called Alpha. But Alpha evolved quickly into a cosmic being who possessed incredible power and um, a, a desire for knowledge, but not really a, a love of combat or conquest. So... Seeing Magneto as an evil individual, he reduced Magneto and the Brotherhood to, to the age of babies. And uh, they were um, taken, I guess, and put in the care of Charles Xavier, who I think what Magneto winds up at um, Moira McTaggart's facility in Scotland as a baby. But he is discovered by the Shire spy Eric the Red and resurrected to adulthood. And not only adulthood, the pinnacle of his physical perfection. Um, so probably like his early 30s. And um, at this point, having been a Holocaust survivor, that was kind of a boon to him because he would have been much older by that point. Uh, so here he is now. He's got the X-Men trapped under his power. He's got them trapped in these crazy chairs which reduce them to the level of infants while they still retain subconsciously the ability to realize who they are they have the capabilities of children and he's created this robot nanny to take care of them hello children it's so nice to meet you i hope we shall all be great friends so he says this complex is going to be their prison and the x-men are going to be trapped uh as babies uh with their minds reduced to the to the level of babies or infants until he sees fit to release them or until they die. An eye for an eye, X-Men. You will not die, but you, you will soon wish you had. You will suffer as I suffered, to be aware of who and what you are, to each possess your powers in their fullest measure, yet to be as unable to use them as a six-month-old child, to be helpless. If there is a hell, X-Men, surely it cannot be more terrible than this. Next issue, Triumphs and Tragedy. So... In the next issue, the X-Men will try to break out, um, and we'll see how that's done. It's pretty amazing. Uh, so I will eventually get a hold of Classic X-Men 19 and cover that cool story as well. Um, another Burn Austin Claremont masterpiece. Meanwhile, we have our backup story by John Bolton and writer Joe Duffy, and it's called Stalking Life. And here we see Jean Grey, beautifully drawn here by John Bolton in a cool... Um, wilderness uh, night scene with this hand in the foreground here menacing perhaps we'll see Jean's reflecting and enjoying just being alone and we see as she is in repose this individual draws a knife and springs at her and who is it we were we are about to see but she ducks out of the way at first surprised and then we, uh, our individual rolls agilely and recovers, and we see it's Logan Wolverine. And now he is facing not Jean Grey, but he is facing Phoenix. So he's upset that she has gone and just left without warning, left the X-Men. And he trailed her here to see what was going on and confront her. Um, the way he says he snuck up on her was to reduce all his thoughts to, to an animal level, which is kind of a neat little trick. And, but he didn't come alone as a costumed banshee is plucked from the shrubbery as he was watching the confrontation. 
effortlessly, I should say, too, by Phoenix. And again, John Bolton on pencils and inks here is um, it's just sublime, just so clean, so beautiful, uh, really able to capture both figure and action here, and just really adept in, uh, at really imparting these characters with so much emotion and energy. So Phoenix has Banshee trapped. I suppose you want to know what I'm doing out here in the middle of nowhere. I think I knew that even before you took off, darling, Wolverine says. You wanted to be alone, and right now, that's the worst thing for you. So they know that she's struggling with her new powers. And she knows they know, but she still wanted to try and make sense of this stuff by herself. And this also ties in a little bit to the extra exposition we got here on page 17 during her fight with, with Magneto. She doesn't know herself yet. She doesn't know what her upper limit is, and that scares her. And so she needed time to drown out all those other thoughts because not only are her telekinetic powers um, augmented to the infinite degree, but her telepathic powers are too, and it must be difficult for her to <clears throat> be on a team and continuously shield out or, or blot out their thoughts, which I'm sure they're, it's effortless for her to read them. So here, um, she decides to have a little fun with them, and there is a lake that's nearby where she was camping, and she effortlessly displays the awesomeness of her cosmic power here by simply lifting this lake all together, every ounce of water out of the lake bed and holding it above their heads. Don't worry, I'll put most of it back. I just wanted to remind you of what you are up against here. You see, for me, Lifting the lake from its bed and holding it intact is not difficult and no harder than getting one quart of water with or without the coffee pot. In some ways, the quart would be harder because it requires more judgment and self-control. It's great how this whole lake is looming above them and Bolton adds this incredible touch with this fish here and Banshee kind of looking up at it a little, uh, a little bit concerned that the entire contents of the lake are going to drop on them. But the discussion seems to be moving along. What suddenly the untimely arrival of Nightcrawler distracts and startles Phoenix. Boo, he says as he teleports into a tree above them. Kurt, Banshee cries. Nightcrawler, no, Wolverine says. Think fast, Liebchen. And he thinks it's a game, dives down to, to tag her. And suddenly the whole leg drops down on them in the forest. And there, there's, a, there's just a... Um, a deluge of water on them. He teleports back to safety here. Um, Banshee can fly, Phoenix can fly, but Wolverine, metal skeleton is really weighing me down, is struggling. And then Jean Grey, Phoenix, plucks him from the waters. Um, Nightcrawler apologizing. Jean, I would never have attacked you then if I had known, but surely what you have the power to do, you must have the power to undo. The lad's right, me darling. Wouldn't that be kind of the precision task you came up here to set yourself? So they're asking her to take all this water that she just plunged into the wilderness and put it back in the lake bed. And as Phoenix, she is equal to the task in these three really cool panels from Bolton. Again, he really uh, knows how to depict superhero action. He does a great job at it, while at the same time being an almost classical artist in his style and his ability to to work and show the figure and these are pencils and inks here and the colors on this by Petra Scott Tees are just gorgeous as well so she takes all that water puts it back in the lake bed where it belongs well done Banshee uh, congratulates her way to go Jeannie Logan says by rights one of you should have cleaned up the, the mess it was your fault oh but it was such a good test for you, wasn't it? Nightcrawler laughs. Besides, Logan says, how could we have undone it? You couldn't, Jean replies, but you still owe me a forfeit. So I'm going to let you, one of you cook dinner and get the water for the coffee. So a uh, bit of a whimsical end there. Uh, another sort of investigation into the struggle that Phoenix had, a struggle that she would eventually lose. 
and she succumbed to the power of the Phoenix Force and became Dark Phoenix um, during the Immortal Dark Phoenix Saga, uh, which is going to be represented in issues to come of classic X-Men. I've got a few of those in the pipeline. We'll be looking at them on the show. Here is our cover to the original issue, 112. Um, now on sale monthly. So X-Men, when it first came out, was a bi-monthly title. And I guess once Marvel got a load of the sales numbers and saw how people were just going um, gaga over it, they quickly made it a monthly title. I think early on that gave uh, Byrne, as he, uh, as he took over on 108, um, time to draw other titles too. I think he was drawing some uh, Iron Fist at the time. Uh, so here we have the original cover. And it is a, um, oh, it's an awesome George Perez, Bob Layton cover, which is kind of cool. Uh, Perez didn't get to draw much of the new X-Men. There's an X-Men Annual 3 that I really would love to cover on here and may do at some point. Um, but that'll be a show for another day. So this has been Classic X-Men 18 on Scott Reed's Comics. I uh, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe, and I'll bring you more later.